Amen. Well, let's jump into part five of this series. Can we do that? Anybody excited about part five? I want to take you to the book of James chapter one once again. Now, I'm going to read a lot of scriptures today, so stick with me. Tap your neighbor on the leg and say, stick with them. Now, today is a day where, if I can be quite candid, uh, I, I'm just going, going to share some things from this sermon. It's going to be direct. It's going to be to the point. Uh, but that's because the question will not be, uh, uh, it hopefully, is it clear? It'll just be what you choose to do with it. Um, but I believe today that we're going to be challenged as we talk about taming the tongue. Uh-oh. Taming the tongue. So we're going to go to James chapter 1, verse 19. The NIV version says this. And we're going to read a lot of passages, so stick with me. James chapter 1, verse 19. NIV says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. And slow to become angry. I'm going to say that part one more time. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If you skip down to verse 26 in the New Living Translation, James chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. And if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. The word religion in this context in the Greek literally means to serve God. Religious means to serve God in the Greek in this context. So let's read it like that. If you claim to serve God, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worth it. Let's jump to James chapter 3 really quick. James chapter 3, 1 through 5 in the NIV says this. James chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 says this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways, and anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large, and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great forest, what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. James chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, and the message says it like this, and then I'm going to preach. Here it is. Oh, I got one more passage I lied. James chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, and the message says this. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark to set a forest on fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. I want to read this last passage, James chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. New Living Translation, James chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. New Living Translation says this. Are you ready? Here it is. This is what I want you to hear it says. It says, sometimes this tongue of ours, it praises our Lord the Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely this is not right. I want to preach today from this simple thought. Proceed with caution. Let me pray, Lord God, I pray now they not hear my voice or see my face, but only hear and see the voice and face of you that lives in me. I decrease as you increase. Have your way in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Proceed with caution. Uh, we've been in this series called Pressure Points. We've been looking at the different areas that through the book of James, pressure is applied to our lives. Pressure meaning uh, this idea of something that is pressed on or, or prodded for the ultimate goal of a perfect life. And again, we've been dealing with the fact of not a perfect life in the cultural context that we know of today, but the word perfect used seven times in the book of James literally means in the Greek, uh, wholeness or integrity. In other words, when James talks about it, uh, coming to a state of perfection, he's not saying without blemish or fault. What he's saying is at the end of the pressure that we receive through this book, we should have a more holistic life, a more congruent life, and a more integrity integral life to the design that God makes in all of our lives. And as we begin to think about this, I begin to think about this idea of proceeding with caution. Anytime you see a sign that says proceed with caution, it is generally indicative of the idea that there's something dangerous or partic particularly maybe detrimental on the other side of the sign. It doesn't mean that you can't go there. It just means you need to be mindful that you need to be careful where you step and what you do. 
It doesn't mean you can't go there, Lord. It just means you need to remain aware. It doesn't mean you can't go there, Miss Minnie. It just means that you shouldn't go there and be distracted in the process. That you should be intent and aware of your surroundings and the circumstances at all times so that you do not unintentionally hurt yourself or damage someone you care about because you did not proceed with caution. Somebody say proceed with caution. In the same like manner, I believe our conversations and our words should have signs that say proceed with caution. I, I genuinely believe, I wish we could all just get a sign. Matter of fact, maybe we'll just all make signs in our lives that say proceed with caution. Wouldn't it be nice in the middle of a conversation when you can see tension starting to boil, people getting aggressive, you're in the middle of an argument with your spouse, wouldn't it be nice to just have a sign you could pull out your back, back pocket that proceed with caution? I mean, like, don't, don't you just wish, like, sometimes, like, you know somebody about to say something, you'd be like, say, say it again. Say it, say it again. Proceed with caution. Maybe it's your child. Maybe you're a parent, and, uh, and your teenager is starting to feel themselves a little bit. And, and, and they got a little snapback in their spirit as of late. And, and, you know, my mama used to say things like, boy, boy, I brought you in this world. I will take you out. And, uh, and it'd be nice when they just start to get a little bit too bold and, uh, and think a little bit too high. They say, boy, proceed with caution. That car you think you got, I will leave it running on empty. And you on the side. The reality of it is we all in our conversations with our words should be mindful and cautious not to just communicate casually because our words have power. And James, knowing this, says to us, anybody who considers themselves religious, or as we just talked about, the word religious meaning to serve God with their lives, should be mindful of their tongue. In Proverbs 21 and 23, it says this, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Whoever guards their mouth and tongue keeps their soul from trouble. The word soul literally is talking about the place that houses our will, our emotions, and our thoughts. And so when we use our tongue casually, we affect people's emotions. We affect people's thoughts. We affect people's willpower when we use our words casually. And here's what I think we all can gather and see clearly from James chapter 1 and 3 for those of us who want to serve God with our lives. Big idea. You ready? A surrendered life requires surrendered speech. A surrendered life requires surrendered speech. This is why this is difficult for many of us, if we be honest, because we come to God already concluding what we intend to release and what we intend to retain. Okay, make it plain. Lord, here's my past. Here's my pain, but I want to retain my preferences. Lord God, I, 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 here are my goals, but I want to retain my gossip. Lord God, here's my addiction, but I want to retain my attitude. Okay. Lord, here's my temptation, but I want to keep my tongue. And the truth of the matter is, we do things like sing songs like, I surrender all. Come on. I surrender all. Y'all know the song. All to. Church folk. I surrender all. And we sing that and then neglect to surrender our speech. James says, you cannot surrender all if you don't also surrender your speech. Otherwise, we have a half-hearted spirituality. This is why we have to be not only cautious about the things we say, but the conversations we expose our lives to. Uh, our daughter Madison, some of you know, but she was in speech therapy, therapy for many years, for many years. And as she was in speech therapy, uh, uh, one of the big recommendations that the doctor gave to us uh, was, hey, at certain point after years of therapy, uh, the three things they had said was, one, you should speak very openly 
around her. So we were encouraged to have casual conversation. But then they also recommended us reading a plethora of books. They said keep reading around her so that you expose her to different vocabulary and to different words. And they said expose her to environments where she can be in casual conversations of her peer group. Just expose her to different conversations so that she can learn words, see how words fit together, see how she can dialogue. In other words, in other words, here's what they taught us. Because the words that you are around, not only you absorb, but they come out of you. May I suggest to you that many of us are just the result of the words we've embraced. They are the words we express. So because we always subject ourselves to conversations of insecurity, the only thing we know how to speak is the language of insecurity. Because we only expose ourselves to conversations of doubt, we only know how to express the language of doubt. Because we only know how to expose ourselves to conversations of, of, of critical nature, we never know how to express grace. The truth of the matter is, if you continue to sit with people and places and things that only know how to talk about things that are contrary to the will of God, what you embrace, you will eventually express. That's why we got to be mindful of our words. Look at your neighbor and say, proceed with caution. It's important that we understand this because this is why so many of us, if we be honest, can't seem to figure out why sometimes our lives take two steps forward and three steps back. Because we've yet to understand the power of our tongue. Notice in James chapter 3 the imagery and the weight that James placed on the power of our tongue. I mean, he talks about horses and ships and forest fires, all just trying to get us to understand the gravity of our conversation, how important it is that we manage what we say. And one of the examples he talks about is this idea of horses and a bit in their mouth. And, and, and I began thinking about this story. My wife and I went on a vacation one time to the Dominican Republic, and we thought it would be a cute idea. You know, when you go on vacation, you try stuff. Look at your neighbor and say, try stuff. So here we are. You know, I'm thinking, I was like, I got this, boo. And, uh, and we decided we were going to ride horses on the beach. Good idea. In theory. Now, because we're cost efficient and we're good stewards, we didn't look for the best resource we could find. We found a cost effective opportunity to ride horses. Look at your neighbor and say, cost effective. Meaning that we could have probably got a more professional organization, but there were some people on the beach. So I got some horses here if you want to ride them. We hopped on the horses. True story, there were people with us. They can testify to this. There were people there. We hopped on the horses, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I don't recall receiving any instruction. Got on the horses. We begin riding. So I, I, that's how I imagine we look. And as we rode, everybody else's horse went right. My horse went left. Why my horse over here and everybody else's horse over here? Now, the gentleman who took us on this ride seemed to not recognize that my horse had went rogue. But Tim, because I had received no instructions... I had no idea what to do with the bit. So here I am, and I'm saying, wherever the horse go, that's where I'm going to be. A horse started to pick up speed. I said, this is the end. Lord, I've served you well. May, my, <laughs> may I have a mansion in heaven, because I don't know what to do. Eventually, uh, the gentleman who was in front of us noticed that my horse began to run off in another direction. He began to come and grab me. I was upset. I was embarrassed. And at no point did I have any clue how to save my own life. Here's what I need you to understand. I began to talk to my little brother about this who actually used to ride horses. And he said something that was interesting. He said the bit in the mouth is intended to apply pressure. And when you apply pressure to the mouth, it changes the direction of the entire horse. Watch this. 
This is why James is trying to help us to understand why our lives many times are in disarray. It's because we haven't got control of our mouth. And because we don't got control of our mouth, we don't got control of our direction. I'm trying to help 20 people today. And you keep trying to figure out why is it that I'm just praying for destiny, but I keep ending up in detriment. It's because you got a prayer life, but you don't got control of your tongue. So you praying for destiny, but you speak in doubt. You praying for destiny, but you speak in security. You pray for destiny, but you speak against your spouse. You say, I want to have a great marriage. And then you shame each other. I'm help, trying to help you to understand it's your mouth that will manage the mission of your life. You got to understand that what James is trying to help us to understand is that your mouth is your most valued weapon. And it can either be dangerous or it can drive you to your destiny. It's in our mouth that we must take greater control. And so some of you might be asking today, well, Vernon, how do we exercise greater caution in our conversation? I'm glad you asked. I have three things today. We're going to be real bad. They say three Ps. Are you ready? The first thing is, I know this is going to be too, too profound for some of y'all. You're going to need five times to get it right. I know, I know we're going to have to repeat it five times because it's just so deep. Look at your neighbor and say, deep. Here it is. You ready? Pause. It's in the text. I didn't make it up. I didn't just choose the easiest word I could find. What's interesting is the first instruction that James gives us is in 1 and 19. What did he say? Be quick to listen and slow to what? Say it again. Be quick to listen and slow to what? One more time for the Holy Spirit. Quick to listen and slow to. In other words, he says, before you start talking, pause. Imagine how much we could protect our lives if we just learn to pause. Proverbs 18 and 13 says this in the NIV. To answer, oh my Lord, before listening, that is folly and shame. Proverbs says we have to learn the art of not talking first. Watch this. Or listening only with the intent to respond. But to really listen and be slow to speak. Here's why. Because a moment of silence could be a moment of maturity. I know we observe moments of silences when people are lost. We want to reflect or remember something. But if you really want to take your life to the next level and serve God with every part of your fiber and being, if you want to serve your spouse better, if you want to serve your kids better, if you want to serve at your job better, if you want God to get glory out of every part of your life, there's some moments where you're going to start to take a moment of silence. I ain't not, I ain't not talking because I'm not involved. I'm not talking not because I'm engaged. I'm not saying anything because I want to think before I, I want to pause. Simple instructions that James gives us says if we would just learn to be slower to speaking, we would say better stuff. Pause. Have you ever said something that you wish you hadn't said after you said it? Come on, let me see your hands. Uh-huh. Have, you have you ever said something prematurely and then you had to get corrected on it and, and, and get humbled? Anybody ever, right? Right? Truth of the matter is, all of us can probably look back to a time. We said, man, I wish I would have taken more time before I spoke definition of this idea of pausing is to understand that not only must we pause, but here's the second thing. Are you ready for this? We then must ponder. Definition of ponder is to think about something carefully, especially before making a decision, watch this one, or reaching a conclusion. Some of our arguments are because we've reached a conclusion before we had a conversation. We, we exaggerate the conclusion in our minds. Come on, everybody's been in a conversation before and somebody has already played out all the potential scenarios, narrowed it down to what you actually did before they ever talked to you about it. I know what you did. No, you don't. We ain't talked yet. But here's what happens. We don't ponder. We don't think cautiously and carefully. And then we come to a conclusion. Again, we always used to hear people say, think before you speak. I want to suggest today there are three types of people in this room. Look at your neighbor and say, you one of them. Three types of people. There are people who think before they talk. There are people 
who think while they talk. And then there are people who think after they talk. You don't got to raise your hand today. I know you ain't going to be completely honest. Some of you are the third person. You say whatever you feel. My emotions said I should say this right now. And then after you say it, you didn't look up and be like, now let me think about that. Is that how I meant for that to come out? Some of you are the second type of person. You think while you talk. That's me. I like thinking aloud. I'm talking this out. Don't take it too serious. Whatever comes out is just me thinking. But when it comes out of your mouth, it's a seed planted. When it comes out of your mouth, you can't get it back. And I am trying diligently to move from person two to person one every day to think before I talk. But it's also important to understand we think in two places, our minds and our hearts. Proverbs 23 and 7 says this, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, how do you think in your heart? Let's go to Luke 2 and 19 really quick. Luke 2 and 19. Look at what happens to Mary when she's ready to prepare the child. It said, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. In other words, she was wrestling with the reality of all of these things and trying to figure out what they meant for her life. In other words, if you are going to be effective in doing anything for the kingdom of God, if you're going to be effective in serving God, you have to understand that your mind is the first level of thinking, but your heart is the last level of thinking. And what God wants to do is God wants you to speak from your heart and not just from your mind. Wouldn't it be amazing? If we could start speaking to people not from the top of my, our mind, but from the bottom of our hearts. Wouldn't it be amazing is if every argument and every conflict that we're in, we would say what I gave back to you wasn't the first thing that came to my mind. But when I really thought about it in my heart, I recognized what I really wanted to say. What if we could give people a response from the bottom of our hearts? And not just the first thing that comes to our minds. Imagine the way we could avoid further conflict and calamity and controversy. But emotion often drives us out of wise conversation. We think in two places. So if we are going to effectively tame our tongue, the first thing we have to do is pause. The second thing we have to do is ponder. And then from our pondering, we should proclaim. Somebody say proclaim. Say it one more time. Say proclaim. Where proclaim is to make a declaration. And here's been the biggest challenge for so many of us culturally. We don't see our words as a declaration. And because we do not take serious the words that come out of our mouth, we think they're just a sentence. But here I need you to understand this today. Every sentence can be a sentence. Say it again because three people missed it. We'll talk to y'all over here. Every sentence can be a sentence to somebody else. And here's the question you should ask yourself every time you speak. Do my words empower or imprison? In James chapter 3, 9 through 12, we see he says, blessings and curses come from the same mouth. We've all heard the familiar passage in Proverbs, life and death lies in the power of the in other words, when I speak, I am not just giving a grammatical sentence. I am giving a life sentence. Now, we can preach a whole other sermon on what to do with people who give you a sentence that you don't want to receive. Because there's one thing to find freedom from the word that people spoke over you that you don't need to agree with. But what we need to learn today is how not to be the one to imprison people with our word. For some of us, we need to be careful because we are spewing out, as the scripture says, blessings and curses from the same mouth. That we will praise the Lord on Sunday, and then we'll talk down to people on Tuesday. That we will tell our kids that they can accomplish anything, and then the next minute we'll tell them you can't accomplish nothing. Y'all quiet in here today. That we will speak life and death, blessings and curses, failure and freedom, fear and faith, all produced by your proclamation. What I worry about today is how many of us are making proclamations that are inconsistent with the purpose of our kids' life. 
or what we want to see in our marriage or what we want to see in our future? Could it be that we have not taken greater accountability in our proclamations? Because every sentence can be a sentence if you're not careful. Some of you in this room today, can we be honest? You are still trying to overcome the sentence that someone said over you. We're still trying to overcome the word somebody said to you when you were a teenager that said you should never do that. And you're still trying to prove your way out. You're still trying to perform your way out. You're still trying to project your way out of their words. Some of us, we are in healthy relationships. If you're dating somebody and you keep saying why they won't commit, it's because they still can't get through the sentence that someone said. The moment somebody told them nobody's ever happy in marriage and that sentence has created an impression that they've never been able to overcome. For some of you, you need to take a greater accountability because you said some things to your kids that they are sitting with. They came to you and said, I believe that I'm going to be this. And you say, ain't nobody going to be that. And your sentence has become their prison. Some of you, you've been in conversations with a friend or a spouse or someone in conflict. And you said some things that you really didn't mean. But because you did not take serious the proclamation that came out of your mouth. Because every seed that comes out of your mouth will grow into something. Here's what I want to challenge you to think about today. It's not deep, but it is hard. Say it again. It's not deep, but it is hard. The true indicator of a surrendered life is a surrendered speech. We used to say things like this growing up. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... And it was the biggest lie we ever heard. Because all of us, if we look around this room, the truth of the matter is we've been hurt by some words. We've heard some things that have made us say, I don't know if I am valuable. and I don't know if I can do that. And I thought they loved me. Lord, why doesn't anybody seem to care? All because there were some words that were not used with caution. So I want to challenge you today as we live our lives trying to serve God in every conversation and in every environment. Really simple. Before you respond, pause. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, can I be honest with y'all? Like if you're in a conversation with your spouse or your friend this week and they're not talking as much, don't be like, say something. That's the, that's the alternative, right? Like you get to the conversation. And then they'd be like, they're trying to actually live out the word. They'd be like, Whew. oh, you ain't going to say nothing? Like, wait, I, I'm trying to do what the pastor said. I'm trying to pause for a minute. I'm trying to ponder and think carefully and cautiously about what I'm saying next. Because I don't want to give you a response from the top of my mind. I want to give you something from the bottom of my heart. I want to be able to effectively articulate what I feel. And then... When you speak, recognize you're producing much more than words. You're producing proclamations that people will live off of for months and years to come. So when you speak to your kids this week, speak as proclamations. When you speak to your spouse, when you speak to your friend, when you speak at your job, tell somebody, hey, you're beautiful. They say, I don't feel beautiful today. That's okay, but I'm proclaiming this into your life. When you talk to your children, say, hey, you can do anything that you desire to do. Don't make your sentences their sentence. Don't imprison them to your limitations. Make up in your mind that you will cautiously choose your words. I want to pray for you today. Would you bow with me?